Welcome back to the weekly news roundup. This is the Linux news edition. So if you want to see what's going on in the Linux world, at least from my crazy perspective, you can go ahead and uh, catch this show. Of course, there's other great Linux news options out there as well. But uh, we're going to go ahead into what was I found interesting this week. Of course, the first is Debian 12.7 rolls out. There's some security and stability improvements. You know, mostly this is just security patches. The biggest thing you need to be aware aware of in this is a, f a very similar thing to what happened with Windows, although not nearly as aggressive or dangerous for your other operating systems. They did upgrade the shim. Um, this is the same type of update that caused the Windows issue. And uh, some distributions are rolling this out. So shim 15.8 is a uh, software package as a first stage bootloader on UFI systems, which could affect users who dual boot. So this is something to keep in mind. It kind of depends on which system is controlling your bootloader and things. Uh, if you do run into a problem, just like Windows, just disable the, uh, the bootloader. Um, I don't know of any issues where this caused serious problems. Of course, the distinction between this and the Windows one is the Windows was not supposed to push an update if it saw another Linux distribution, but they never tested it for seeing that Linux distribution on a secondary disk. And that's really what their problem was. Additionally, the thing that the thing that Windows upgraded was actually Grub and that was patched by Linux years ago, like a year and a half ago. And so that was unnecessary for Windows to even do because if Grub is there at all, it was put there by Linux distribution and the Linux distribution is taking care of that. Uh, but there's Windows trying to be big brother like, eh. uh, but this is going to be something that may possibly affect some dual booting systems. So be aware of that. It revokes signatures of older versions of shim, uh, which could impact this. This is probably related to the, in fact, probably the windows and this one is probably closely related to that issue where secure boot was dis uh, was rendered completely useless on hundreds of computers. My guess is this probably relates to fixing to that. Just disable secure boot won't be a problem. We also have upgrades to AMD 64 and Intel microcodes. So, uh, and I actually did some reading on the microcodes because I'm not I'm not a guy that gets into the hardware and stuff. Uh, so the AMD 64 microcode also impacts your Intel. The Intel ones bring some extra work. So if you're running Intel, don't remove AMD 64. It will break your system. Uh, so I I actually dug into this because the way an Intel processor works still uses the AMD chipsets. It's just a different processor type. And so there is, uh, uh, just be aware that there are some changes to that. And then mostly just a few other security changes. You will get these changes just by doing a regular update of your system. Also significant with this release is the, um, the Bullseye series Debian 11 is now now gets updated to 11.11, .11, which is now labeled as old stable, meaning, hey, update this crap sometime soon. So there you have it, guys. There's some updates to Debian. Now we get into mo some more interesting things. Um, a post open licensing could offer software devs funding alternatives. So this is a long article. Of course, all the articles are listed. Uh, you go to the website. There's a in the description of the video there's a link to the website the website lists all of the articles so you can go read this and um i didn't realize this is from may uh usually i don't uh, uh usually i don't include things that are not in the very current uh, my apologies for that but you know sometimes people drop stuff into my matrix server and i don't connect that the that the dates are correct so if you are dropping news into my matrix server i do appreciate it but please make sure they are within the last week <laughs> so anyway but it was still a an, an interesting article that uh, I think is more impacting of Linux and other things. It definitely deals with the FOSS world. So there's this fight over which type of software licenses should be using. And uh, of course, FOSS is useful, but it's sometimes being exploited in some cases by business where, you know, you see, you've seen that meme where, where the, the entirety of the, uh, of the project is being upheld by one little package maintained in the spare hobby time of one guy in Nebraska, you know? So, 
Of course, if he closes the system down, pulls the code, or simply fails to update it, the whole thing will topple down. That's kind of what they're getting at. And so in order to pay the developers, what these guys are proposing is a system which is kind of based more on your usage and you pay after you're using it for a period of time. Not entirely unheard of, as this is sort of a model that uh, I know LibreOffice goes with for business, where you know they're like, yeah, the software is free and open source. You can use it for free. There's no problem if you're a, a small individual, small business person and you're using LibreOffice and you're you know you're doing it. It's perfectly fine to do that. But they're saying if you're a huge company, rather than just downloading 50 copies of LibreOffice for free, we would kind of like a little bit of support for that. And so this is sort of uh, that what they what they did a couple years ago with. That. So they'll they they'll have branding as like the community and the corporate edition, and other others um, software and systems have gone with similar models. I'm okay with that, and that kind of is the precursor to what's going on here, where they're using okay, it doesn't cost you anything to use, but at the end of the year, you look at your bottom line, and then you give a, a small percentage back to the developers. That sort of is what is going on here, and so it's very interesting to see as a means to actually help and support the developers that are making the various software. So that's kind of neat. All right, uh, the Ubuntu is working on a new security ses, uh, center, and I was going to cover this when I first heard about it sometime in the middle of the summer. I decided to table it because there was really nothing to report as of yet other than, hey, this is a thing they're working on. It's still kind of in that, but hey, we have the first thing in here. So Let's go ahead and chat about it now, and then yeah, we'll do another video when this thing's actually ready, uh, if it is. So the idea behind this is kind of like a security center that you find inside of the uh, inside of your your phone settings. So they're working on a variety of different security options, and they have a list of things they're going to do. Right now, what they're doing is working with snaps, so you can install this thing. And the first one is Snap. So the idea here is that a Snap is sandboxed, but you can set them to go outside of their sandbox for certain tasks. What you can do is you can force it to require a specific permission every single time it does that. So now anytime a Snap wants to go out to something outside its sandbox, it will give you a pop-up window to show you. So this is based on Flutter. And uh, the, the aim is to make, make it ha easy to handle a lot of different security settings, including full disk encryption, uh, network facilitating, firewall control, uh, software apps, and things like that. You can test it out by installing the desktop security center. Uh, you also need the prompting client. Uh, they mentioned the prompting client down here. You might need to install the prompting client as well. So this is a kind of a GIF as to how this is working. So what they're doing here is uh, on Firefox, you hit to download a file, and as it goes to download, you're going to get this dialog box that shows up here in the left. And that is asking permissions. Do you want to always accept this, always accept it for the current session or block it? So anytime you're trying, you're using a snap and it tries to go outside of the sandbox, you have to grant it explicit permissions. So it's working on that and a number of other security options, effectively trying to create a system for Ubuntu like a security setting in a phone. So this is actually a kind of neat, compelling project. I'm keeping my eye on it. I'm curious to see where this is going going to go down the road. And on to our chief story, Rust in the Linux kernel uh, causes the uh, lead developer retires rather than dealing with, quote, non-technical nonsense. The problem is, as you're looking at all this kind of stuff, and that kind of is technical nonsense. It's, I think it's just a battle between two types of code systems. And uh, who knows, maybe this is why the Bible says don't create a, a shirt that has, you know, <laughs> this type of fabric and that type of fabric together. I don't know. Uh, so the Linux kernel is mostly C and and a lot of the guys on the Linux kernel have been there for a long time. So you got a bunch of old fogies with their C language. And now you got this up and coming language called Rust. And the idea here is that Rust is, is ultimately a better, more, like it's a more mature technology, better technology. And so there's, there's this push to put Rust everywhere. You know, Cosmic is built on Rust. The Cosmic developer has created their distro and I've 
forgetting the name of it off the top of my head. Maybe somebody can throw it in the comments there and I'll see it. Uh, but it's an entire distribution based explicitly on Rust, including a custom Linux kernel code, which is entirely Rust as well. Uh, and so the problem is, is that as we're trying to shift the Linux kernel over to a better programming base, there's this infighting between the C developers and the Rust developers because Rust and C, as you might imagine, behave slightly differently from each other. And because they're behaving slightly differently from each other, you have to build bridges to make them talk to each other. And there's uh, there's questions about who is responsible for these bridges. And so the whole idea is this, this giant fight between, you know, if something breaks somewhere, usually if you're doing the Linux kernel something and you do something which breaks some portion of the code, it's your responsibility to fix the portion of the code that it breaks. But if you're having a Rust developer who doesn't know C and a C developer who doesn't know Rust, they're fighting over who's supposed to fix this stuff. And the other issue is that there's a lot of things in the Linux kernel that they do don't actually have any documentation as to what the application does. So you literally have to read the code to know exactly what it does. How does it handle null, null situations, null numbers, and things like that. And so there's a lot of fighting and discussion about this. Now, if you do want a really good, more technical breakdown, Brody has a video on this. Uh, this week, and it is excellent. You should go take a look at that uh, on Brody's channel. Uh, but uh, the ultimate idea here is that there's this fight. Now, understand this. I want to mention this as well as it relates to old fogies like me. And I have actually, I completely believe the IQ levels in our world are dropping. We are indeed approaching idiocracy. Maybe not as quick, although that was set several years in the future. But as we approach idiocracy, the competency of people decreases. I think this has to do with a lot of factors. You know, we have technology that gets around the idea that we have to work through things as much. So C is a much better language in the terms of what it can do, but that also means it can do everything. C is like Linux. You can completely break Linux, but you can completely do absolutely everything that you want. You can pull out certain software. There's nothing that stops you from doing so. And you can cause workarounds to allow your system to still work with some critical component of the fun uh, software taken out. You can do anything you want, but you have to know a little bit more about how to do it. So the old time Time, old school C developers might have more knowledge about how to do these things, albeit some of the things fell through the cracks. Some of them fell through the cracks just because updates to the soft core software package as security vulnerabilities have been discussed just haven't been patched and fixed as, as fast because people don't know they're there. You know, hence the code is a lot of, you know, the Linux kernel is a lot of code. And so the problem is, is that as our IQ drops, people aren't as able to use C in the modern era as they were able to use C in the past. And the problem with C isn't that it's a bad language, it's that you have to manually set memory permissions and other parameters. You have to manually release memory. All this type of stuff has to be handled in the code. Whereas Rust is called a memory safe language, so it does all the allocation of memory easier. You can think of Rust as something more like a Windows or a Mac. It wants to do a lot of things for you. It doesn't allow you to do things that's going to break itself. Uh, but in so doing, it limits what you can do with it. And so there's this fight where the C developers don't want to take the time to learn Rust because it's not as versatile, and the Rust developers don't want to take the time to learn C because it's a little bit overly complicated. And so we have this fight as we try and merge the Rust code into the C code, and when you're working with the Linux kernel, there tends to be a lot of infighting. Now, they say non-technical nonsense, but the reality is most of the infighting is who is fixing the junctions when the Rust contributed code breaks C. However, some of the Rust people do have a point in that they write perfectly good, some of them write perfectly good C code and they push things up, but because they're primarily Rust developer, the maintainer of that portion does not want to fix, uh, does not want to merge their C code. And so there's this fighting about it where some people in the Rust community thinks that the Linux kernel is just trying to keep Rust out of it, and some people in, this, in the uh, uh, C community are just like, why should we do this with Rust when we can do it with C? So it is a never-ending story of nonsense that, honestly, to Brody's point, if they sit down and talk, they could probably figure this stuff out. But there is some fighting about it. Now, what does this ultimately mean for us? 
and the end users of all this who are not the programmers. Not a lot right now, although if the if the language were to if they were to sit down and work on people to fix a lot of the issues and merge a lot of rust into the system it might actually produce a more stable kernel down the road it might do it with a little bit less code it might do it with a little bit more security and stability the problem is there's this transitional time that we need to do that it's not good to have to rebuild the entire kernel entirely in rust but there is some transitional time, and I think you just need somebody with the tough skin to, to tough it out in the midst of it. So um, <laughs> that's really what this article is about. It's, it's a very interesting and fascinating approach, but, you know, it is what it is. So whatever happens, I guess, happens. So if you want to help support the channel, we do have a Locals page. We are returning. Uh, we will be returning to our short stories. Of course, it is uh, nine days. I have my outline done. I have nine not started on the story yet so by the end of september we will get one out i might change my release schedule to the end of the month instead of the middle of the month i don't know yet we'll see i might actually have time to sit down and write the whole thing but that is coming back uh, of course we are still working on getting the book produced and i've literally been lazy and done very little on it this week uh but we're getting there. We're getting there. The book will be out by the by Christmas for sure. So it could be a good stocking stuffer for you, uh, for everybody, of course. But uh, if you would jump in on any of our support uh, support channels, you can read those stories and get the audiobooks as they roll out. Switch to Linux.locals.com.